Winnie Auma, today's guest, is helping to lead Village Enterprise, a top-rated nonprofit helping those living in extreme poverty in rural Africa to create businesses that lift families and communities. Applying scientific methodology, she measures impact in both economic results and lives changed. She'll also share insights about her superpower. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. Welcome to the Superpowers for Good show. Winnie, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm just so thrilled to have an opportunity to visit with you uh, all, all the way on the other side of the world from Uganda. It's just a thrill. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. And so thank you for inviting me to just have this discussion with you. Such a pleasure to connect and meet and just to share you know, my experiences, my learnings, and then the work we do. Well, you are doing some truly amazing work. And I am just so inspired. Uh, as I was reading about the, in the background information that you and your team provided, uh, you're working on poverty uh, eradication using such a scientific approach and, you know, measuring so painstakingly progress. And I'm really kind of interested to dig in. So why don't you tell us, you know, give us some big picture information about this and let's dig into it some more, but give us the big picture. Thank you so much. So yes, um, <clears throat> uh, we implement a poverty graduation model. And uh, what that really means is that it's, uh, for those of you who know already about poverty graduation, it's a set of sequence interventions that are targeted specifically to individuals that live on a dollar ninety a day. Now, as an organization, we have been doing this for over 30 years. So definitely, yes, we've had experience in this field and we have you know, built our feet on the ground um, in East Africa. And so the work that we do here is really focused on people that are living on less than a dollar 90 a day. And for us, we really care to make sure that first of all, we're reaching those individuals. And so we use uh, what we call the poverty probability index survey to ensure that we're reaching the very bottom of the pyramid. And once we know that we have got those individuals on the table, we then take them through a series of you know, trainings. And once they have received this training, we provide um, a seed capital grant of uh, you know, $150 you know, $100 first, and then we follow up with $50. And then our business mentors who are hired from these communities then continue to provide targeted mentoring support for a period of, you know, one year throughout as these individuals are, you know, implementing their businesses. They're helping them think about diversification, expansion, value addition. And so these individuals that we train, you know, three of them come from three different households to constitute that small business group that launch a business. And then 10 of them constitute what we call the business savings groups. And the business savings group provide that platform where they are community members, you know, they save together, they borrow together. And that's really important for individuals that live on less than a dollar ninety a day because you need that social capital. You need that network, especially like, you know, there, this, these have been very hard times. The pandemic, for example, created a lockdown, isolation, and you need a, you need a network that of people that you can rely on for mental, for support, for social support, you know, to borrow in times of an emergency, and just a safe place to keep your money. And so we've been doing this for over 30 years. And in 2014, um, you know, as an organization, we took the decision and uh, we implemented our first randomized control trial study where we tested different segments of our program. And that was very important because when you are working with extreme poor, you want to make sure that you're implementing a program that is tested, that is validated, that is creating the impact you want to see in the community. 
And uh, the randomized controlled trial study was such a success. We saw increases in consumptions. We saw increases in you know, expenditure. We saw increases in assets. And so as a result of that randomized controlled trial study, we became the first organization out of 80 that was selected to implement the first development impact bond in poverty elevation in Africa. And just this week, actually on Tuesday, we released the results of that study. And uh, the results are so amazing and very exciting. And through the implementation of the Development Impact Bond, we learned so much. The DIB alone allowed us to reach 95,000 individuals. We impacted 95,000 individuals. We started 4,766 you know, businesses and we trained 200, um, we trained 14,100 you know, people, new entrepreneurs, people that had not run a business before. And, uh, you know, through this study, it's been projected that, you know, the study alone will have a lifetime impact of 21 million US dollars in incomes for areas and communities that were impacted. Wow. Wow. That's, that is uh, amazing. That is amazing. There, there's so much I want to drill down on. Um, uh, first, uh, I, I'll ask you to send me the uh, the results, if you would, by email, and I'll put them. Uh, I'll link to that in the uh, in the show notes article that I'll write about our conversation, so people Absolutely. can access that. Absolutely. Um, now, one of the things that I think is really intriguing and that I really quite like, I think, but I'm not sure I understood it right, but let's go back to this. I think that you start off your entrepreneurs in this program with a small grant, initially $100, adding 50 later. Um, and and then they join a group that I think they can borrow from, right? That, that they pool their money this is a practice that's done around the world, right? And it has a lot of different names and traditional practices, but, you know, 10 or 12 people pool their money. So, but the interesting, interesting thing is it doesn't start with a micro loan. It starts with a micro grant. And uh, micro loans have, have been proven to be quite helpful, but they also sometimes stress people out. A few people have committed suicide after not being able to pay off those little loans. How is the, tell us a little bit about why you use grants and not loans and how it, how you think that's working and why it's better. I'm really curious about what you're seeing. That's an excellent question. Um, and I hear you. I think there's just, um, there's just so much difference in terms of the people that we work with. And so let me try to paint a picture. I know i um, you know, sometimes it can sound cliche, you know, but let me try to paint a picture using just, uh, you know, one of the entrepreneurs that we work with. And so, um, you know, a lady called um, Aliao Agnes, you know, when she, when we first visited her and her family during the targeting process, you know, she was struggling with just missing the basic needs for her household you know, clothes, you know, being just be able to buy the clothes, being able to feed our children, you know, pay for, you know, the school fee of, pay for the education of our children. Of course, here in Uganda, there's universal education, primary education, but then you're still supposed to provide scholastic materials for your children, the uniform, the books, and she was struggling with that. You know, and there was also just economic pressure that created tensions between her and her husband, and they were and they were fighting all the time. They were quarreling, and then she was battling daily with the decisions: Do you buy food, or do you prioritize education? Do you prioritize shelter, or do you prioritize education? And these are the complexities. These are the issues that people who live on less than a dollar a day. These are decisions they have to make on a day-to-day -day basis. And so in terms of the work that we do, when we get out to the communities, first we look for the poorest regions. Then within those poorest regions, we identify those households 
you know, that fall on a dollar ninety a day. And so uh, once we identify, we do our targeting at the household level, and then household will self-select who within their household will represent them. So three individuals from three different households will come together and constitute that you know, small business group. And so that business savings group is the one that you know, gets to launch the business through the grant that we provide. And we provide you know, $150. And um, we've actually just last year increased that to $180. And so because to take care of inflation. And we give that in two part payments. But let me just explain why grants and not loans. I just talked about Agnes and her story. She does not have collateral. So definitely financial, when you think about financial institutions, she's not their customer. When you talk about our culture and cultural norms, globally, women only own 15% of the land. So to even for her to think about going to a financial institution and like borrowing a loan, that's, what is she going to give us collateral? That's difficult. And then she's already struggling to feed her children, to clothe them, to give them education, to treat them. It's very difficult for, for her and, and, and her husband to then think about a loan because they don't have you know, the resources to be able to mobilize and pay that loan. And so we give a grant as village enterprise in order to kickstart them, to provide them a stepping stone. And it's also just not about the grant. You know, it's one thing to give the money, but it's another thing for you to know how to use that money and how to use it to build wealth, to create additional opportunities for yourself, your household, and your children. And so generally for us, you know, it's, it's you know, giving the grant is one step, but providing the training is another step. And we actually validated during our first randomized control trial study that this combined approach, providing the training, the mentoring, the seed capital grant, putting them in the savings group, outperformed cash alone because we tested that, you know, we tested giving cash alone because, you know, they, there are a lot of programs out there that just give cash alone. So we tested that, we, but generally we proved that the combined approach of training, mentoring, seed capital grant, and providing them that you know social network through their savings groups that allows them then to go and borrow if they need additional money beyond what village enterprise has provided. They can go to their you know they can go to their village bank and borrow it, you know, because they have established trust. You know, they have built, and it's a bank where they all save money, and so they trust each other, they know each other. And you know, to borrow money from an institution, you require trust, you require collateral, you require history. And a lot of, a lot of you know, individuals that live in rural Africa, women and men don't have that. And so that's why as Village Enterprise, our initial step around lifting people out of extreme poverty, is equipping them with those resources. You know, that resource being the training, the mentoring, the seed capital grant, you build a network around yourself. And then we give you that small seed capital grant in order to be able to launch a business that you can then grow over the period of time. And we have seen from our randomized control trial study, both in the first one and the development impact bond that Long beyond the life of the project, these businesses continue to, you know, exist. They continue to multiply, you know, their consumptions, their incomes continue to increase. Yeah, that's, uh, it's such an exciting uh, insight. Uh, in essence, uh, that, that kickstart of a little bit of grant money uh, helps get them in a position to where micro lending in that shared community bank village bank model works very well I, it's 
Very exciting. I, I, I want to shift now to the development impact bond that uh, recently completed. And if I understand correctly, you, you tell me if I get this wrong, but I think you borrowed over $4 million, uh, achieved the outcomes that were designed, that were required for repayment from USAID and other payers. Um, those payers paid it off. And uh, so the, the lenders from up front who risked it all to, on, based on these criteria got all their money back with some interest, right? Yes. So uh, I, I'd like you to sort of get into the weeds a little bit and tell us about what the program was that was funded, what the metrics were a little bit for, for the repayment and how they were achieved. Uh, so we kind of understand what did we really learn from the success of the development impact bond? Thank you very much. So the development impact bond really differs from you know, traditional um, you know, contracts that fund social programs because you know, it ties payment to outcomes that you can only get paid when you achieve results. So you can't get paid for training people. You can't get paid for giving a grant. You only get paid if your training changed the lives of people, if your training you know, um, impacted and increased consumption and expenditure. And so for the village enterprise bond, the specific areas around uh, the metrics were centered around increasing consumption and expenditure and then net assets. And so the way it was structured is that we had nine upfront investors that gave us, you know, you know, 4 point, um, you know 32 million in order to be able to implement our activities. And then we had three outcome payers that put money aside and said, Village Enterprise, if you achieve your results, we will pay the investors, you know, all of their investment, you know, capital. And so we were the service provider, you know, in this case. And, and so we, the, 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 the impact bond really, you know, helped us as an organization to redirect our attention on impact rather than activities. It provided us that opportunity, shifted the organizational culture so that we could focus on impact. It shifted the organizational culture so that we could think about you know, how technology, you know, it accelerated how we were using technology as an organization. And so specifically for the impact bond, we were able to start, you know, 4,766, you know, businesses, 14,100 uh, 14, first, uh, first time entrepreneurs that we trained. And of course, like I mentioned, there were 95, you know, thousand lives that we, we impacted. And so in terms of the results specifically, you know, we were able to see that, you know, 118, you know, 118 percent of consumption target was achieved. So we increased that consumption by that amount. We were also able to achieve a cost benefit ratio of 140. And that was so important because in this work, there are so many people that are living in extreme poverty, over 400 million in Africa. And so you want to make sure that you're implementing a very cost effective model that allows you to be able to reach many. And we were able to validate that. We were able to actually implement the development impact run in a very cost effective way, cost effective way that we hope can continue to, to allow us to scale. We were able to increase spending on food, on health, on education by 6.3%. We were able to increase assets, you know, such as livestock, housing, saving, and other business, you know, supplies within the households by 5.8%. 
And to put this in context, this was during the pandemic. <laughs> and, you know, remember, right. there was a lockdown, you know, transportation was halted. In Uganda, it was even worse because, you know, markets got, you know, community markets got opened almost a year later. And so, you know, our entrepreneurs, you know, uh, we are able to demonstrate resilience and to see that in the face of COVID-19 that we were able to implement this, you know, I think for me was amazing. And so to talk a little bit about, you know, um, why it was very important for Village Enterprise to really, you know, dive deeper and implement the, you know, the development impact bond. I think one thing is that we really wanted to create evidence that innovative funding models can costively help scale up, you know, graduation. I think in the past, you know, you hear how that graduation is very expensive. Graduation is in all of is very expensive, but I think it's important to see that we were able to cost effectively do that. Do that. And then the other thing I think that the development impact bond allowed for us to be able to do is just to attract this additional funding, attract new funders to the space, you know? And that's very important for development in general because, you know, if we can find ways for, you know, investors to then be attracted to get to development, I think it pays out. As an investor, you get back your money with a profit, uh, you know, as a, as a person in the development space, as an outcome payer, you only get to pay for results. You don't pay for activity, you pay for a product that works, that changes the lives of people. And I think that is very important. And I think for us as Village Enterprise, it was really excellent to be able to be a part of this philanthropic community, a part of this you know, network of well-recognized funders and international development experts from USID, you know, development, uh, development uh, innovation ventures, FCDO, you know, all of that was really important for us as an organization as we built, you know, our capacity. And, of, and then, of course, now that the results are out, there's just so much excitement for us because, first of all, we have proved that, you know, there is impact even at, like, cross-country level because we did this in Kenya and in, and, and in Uganda. And these are two different contexts, and we were able to build an evidence base for this, like, multi-context intervention. And then, you know... I think also the other thing just is, you know, just showing that traditional funding is good, but I think moving towards outcome-based or results-based funding is going to be, you know, an important path if we're really serious about ending extreme poverty. So I don't want to talk a lot. I want to pass it back to you. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, I really appreciate you taking a few minutes to walk us through this because, uh, you know, the, these impact bond structures uh, have demonstrated an interesting potential, uh, but also have, in my limited experience with them, some limitations. And I'm excited to see the success of this one, uh, because it gives me hope that there are ways to apply this going forward. Uh, yeah. um, I want to just shift gears now a little bit and talk more about you, Winnie. Um, you got started with Village Enterprises about a decade ago. Uh, now you're a big deal uh, internationally. But you started out as a volunteer. Will you tell us a little bit about your life before you got to Village Enterprises, uh, Village Enterprise, and then how it's changed since you got involved. Give, kind of give us your life story in this context. Help us understand a little about you. Thank you so much. Um, you know that that's an excellent question. Uh, there's a lot to my story, but I'll try to keep it short and also. You know, I don't want to sound cliche, but, you know, for me, the work that I do at Village Enterprise is very close to my heart because, 
I have also come from very humble backgrounds. And so I have experienced extreme poverty myself. I have watched my mother make tough decisions. I've watched you know, women make tough decisions around what do you prioritize? Is it food, education, or health? And sometimes as a girl growing up, I actually got to be on the other side of life where either a boy child was prioritized over me or, you know, something was prioritized over me in a family. Um, so, but I was, I, I, I think I've been a, a dreamer and, um, you know, along the path of my life, I kind of felt like there were helping hands put along my journey. So people that I didn't know within my community, you know, I lived with a Catholic father at some point. Um, and then to get to the university, I got um, a scholarship from the Carnegie Corporation of New York to pursue my, you know, degree in education. So my background actually is in education. And so when I, when I completed my degree from Makere University in Education, I came out and started teaching uh, and doing administrative work. But you know, when you have experienced struggles in your life, I really wanted to make a mark in the world. I wanted to change the world. I wanted to do something so that girls would not have to go through what I have gone through, so that mothers would not go have to go through what my mother went through, so that mothers could have options and really meet the needs and provide, you know, for their families. And so, you know, opportunity came for me to 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 join Village Enterprise. And although I was like teaching, you know, I felt like it was going to take ages before I could see the impact of my work. Because, you know, when, when, you, when you're a teacher, you train, you teach people, but, you know, it's going to take years before they can actually start, you know, to do the work. And it's very meaningful work and it's a very noble job. But I kind of wanted to do something that would give me gratification that I could start to see the results in the immediate future. And because Village Enterprise was working around the community in Tessa subregion where I came from, I paid attention to what was happening um, internally when they had positions. And so they were recruiting for volunteers and, um, you know, I, I quickly jumped to the opportunity. I actually left full-time teaching to go and volunteer because like I felt they were, they, were, they, were, they were working on something that was close and dear to my heart. And I'm so glad I made that decision because you know, from joining as a volunteer, you know, I've been through different roles in the organization, the previous one being country director. And um, you know, throughout my leadership within the organization, when I joined Village Enterprise, Uganda had like less than, you know, five staff. And so when I was there, it grew a little bit. And then when I became country director, we went from, you know, under 10 staff to 77 staff. Um, you know, our country operations grew. The number of businesses we were starting um, on, a, on a year, on an annual basis grew. And, and so... I think if you find something that is dear to your heart, you find the energy every day to learn, you find the excitement to do the work. And um, when I go to the communities in the field to talk with people, to meet with these entrepreneurs, I always put myself in their shoes. I imagine myself on the other side of the table and and ask myself, what would I want to hear if I was on the other side of the table? What message would I want people to be telling me? And I try to find the opportunity to be able to be a voice um, that advocates for the work that we do within Village Enterprise and other noble causes that are, that are being done by other organizations and other individuals. And in my own small ways, finding ways to support girls and women in my community. So yeah, that's, that's my short and long story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. 
That's fantastic. Uh, you are such a role model for so many people, uh, including me. Uh, I, I, I am learning from you as we talk. I'm grateful for the insights you're sharing with me because uh, your experience, you know, with some of these really technical aspects of, of nonprofit leadership um, you've mastered, and I'm grateful that you had share. Uh, I mean, there's some real technical stuff in this development impact bond world, and uh, you're crushing it. So I, I appreciate you putting that context around it in terms of your life story as well. Um, you've done some great things. Uh, what do you see as your superpower that enables you to do great things? Thank you. That's a, that's a hard question, but um, I love the challenge. Uh, so when I really think about my superpower, I think my superpower is my, I believe, and now my superpower is my voice. Um, because I use my voice to, 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 to spread optimism, spread positivity. Um, I use my voice to inspire other people. I think, you know, over the years, even when I go to the community, you know, I feel I'm a role model to women, girls, you know, even in my workplace, I feel like I'm a role model to other, you know, professionals within the organization. And, um, I try to use my voice to advocate for causes that are dear to my heart and, you know, you know, ending extreme poverty in my lifetime would be something that, you know, would make me want to, you know, you know, scream and shout if, if we can do that. And so yeah. that's what I believe is my superpower. And just like empathy, putting yourself in the shoes of other people and helping them and, and just bringing your best self to work every day. Because yeah. poverty is complex. And there's so much I can do as Winnie. But we all have a responsibility on a daily basis to take those small incremental steps that allow us combined collectively as individuals as a force to be able to end extreme poverty. Yeah. I, I want to follow up on this idea that your superpower is in your your voice and sharing optimism and positivity because it strikes me that that really might be uh, super important and I think it's hard to do and and some of us in in this work uh, broadly defined of trying to solve the world's big problems we get so focused on the problems that we we talk about the problems uh, you know we get very knowledgeable we can spout statistics and and we kind of start to sound a little bit down all the time uh, and, and so your optimism and your and sharing that with other people might be really important so i wonder if you can think of a time when using your voice to share that positivity, to share optimism, had a particular uh, outcome that you're happy about or proud of. Can you think of an example when that happened? Yeah, um, I think I can think about um, two particular moments. So I remember in 2017 going to a field visit in Amoria with um with some of my colleagues and um we had gone to visit you know a business savings group that was struggling and it was struggling because you know some of the men you know whose wives were a part of the program you know one of the men had decided to take the money away from the wife 
And then, um, you know, the two other members, you know, felt like, you know, they didn't, they no longer wanted to be a part of the problem, program because of this. And then there were also just um, other issues within the savings group. So I go into this group and I think part of sharing positivity is you also have to listen. You also have to understand the problem. And so we went into this group, we listened, and um, I started to probe and ask questions. And then I got up and shared my personal story. And the lines that I shared was something like this. I shared and told them that, you see, you look at me. I am the woman today because my mother made sacrifices. My community members made sacrifices. You know, people in the world, the Carnegie Corporation gave, you know, resources to support me. You are part of the Village Enterprise Program today because there are so many people outside in the world that are believing in you. They want you to invest these resources into a business that generates profits so that you can support your own family. We don't want this money back. They don't want this money back. The only thing they want from you is that you're using it in ways that are profitable to generate more income that supports you and your entire family. And so the man, the husband to one of our entrepreneurs who had taken the money, got up and said, you know, Winnie, I had never thought about it that way. I actually usually thought that my wife's money was her money, you know? And I actually thought that by her coming to do the trainings, by her coming, that she was threatening my authority as a husband in the home. I didn't see it from the perspective that by her and her group raising and generating these profits and making money, that it's going to be an investment that shapes our own you know, family. And that you are an example of an investment that other people made. And you are, you know, giving us the opportunity to be investing in our children and so that our children can grow. And that's when it struck me that, you know, it's important the narrative we share, but also how we share and understanding contexts and peoples and, and challenges is important so that you can use your voice authentically. And I want to bounce back and kind of bring Village Enterprise in the picture here. I think one thing that Village Enterprise has really done, you know, well that, you know, has kept me in the organization for years is this focus on local leadership. You know, and I think that was very important because I understood the context. I knew the people. They spoke the language that I listened. And I feel um, that if we're going to solve these global problems, these global challenges that we're dealing with, we have to get local people at the forefront. And not talk in leadership, but have them be the people that make the decisions, that drive the change, that innovate. And so I didn't tell this man what to do. I only used my story and my experience to, infight, to inspire him to go, do good for himself, his wife, and his children. And, and I think that that's very important as we think of ways to really solve global problems. Yeah, that's a, a great additional thought, uh, that need for local leadership. And you're, you're the perfect example of that, uh, the power of that, how much uh, better it works because of your shared experience. And you're able to tell him a story that, you know, a, a, you know, a guy like me marching in there uh, couldn't have done. 
I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have shared that story. I couldn't have empathized with him nearly as effectively. Yeah, great, great point. Well, Winnie, I apologize. We've gone on uh, far longer than I told you we would. And uh, I, I know your time is incredibly valuable. I'm so grateful that you have been willing to hang in patiently with us. Um, before you go, would you just take a minute and tell people how they can learn more about Village Enterprise and how they can connect with you, maybe on social media? Yeah, thank you so much. Well, um, for everyone out there, um, you know, thank you for listening and thank you for joining us today. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Village Enterprise, please check us on our website. You know, you can also follow Village Enterprise on, on our Twitter handle, on our LinkedIn, you know, handle, on our Instagram um, handle. You can also check me out, um, you know, at Winnie Auma. You'll find me on, you know, Facebook, on Twitter. And yeah, and reach out to us. Contacts are there on our website. We'll be happy to, to just start conversations with you and, and forge ways around how we might be able to partner together to solve these complex global problems. Yeah, well, you, you are doing such incredibly good work. I'm excited. You know, we think about uh, the SDGs and the, the 2030 deadline that's approaching now pretty rapidly, setbacks of the pandemic. Uh, certainly getting behind your work makes a lot of sense today because you've now proven in so many different ways that you've got a model that works for uh, ending poverty. Uh, we need to just help you scale up. Uh, there are a lot more countries in Africa where you're not working than where you are, and we need your help. So uh, we wish you every success, and uh, thank you again for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for spreading, you know, uh, spreading the word and, you know, helping all of us come and share in your platform. Appreciate that. All righty. Let's do some good. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Superpowers for Good show twice each week. We host changemakers who share their impact, insights, and superpowers. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today at superpowersforgood.com. That's superpowers, number four, good.com. Be super empowered. Get your copy of the book, Superpowers for Good, as an ebook, audiobook, paperback, or hardcover edition via your favorite online retailer. Interested in having me speak to your company, organization, or association? Visit devonthorpe.com. Then let's talk. Now, keep using your superpowers for good. Together, we can reverse climate change, improve global health, and eradicate poverty.